Harvey Weinstein, Bill O'Reilly, former San Diego Mayor Bob Filner. What do they all have in common? They're powerful men accused of sexually harassing women. It's a problem that's been going on for years. So joining us on the Kogo News Live line is SDSU business ethics lecturer and attorney Dan Eaton. And Dan, in many of these cases, this was an open secret. So how is it that they get away with it? Because, uh, LaDonna, sexual harassment is basically about power. And so the greater the power gap between the harasser and the victim, the greater the potential for abuse. It's no accident, LaDonna, that you're hearing when you list that that name, those names, uh, that these uh, women are finally coming forward when the perceived power of the alleged perpetrators is in decline because then the fear factor is not as great and the fear of consequence is not great. The other thing that happens that brings people forward is where the person feels as though they have nothing left to lose is when there's an abrupt termination, which you saw in the case of Gretchen Carlson at Fox. Okay, so let's talk about what goes on in in the mind of a, a, a harasser. You said it's about power. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a, is it ever about more than that in their mind? Are they are they maybe compensating for something else? Where maybe when they were younger and not popular. Okay, I'm a lawyer, not a psychologist, so I'm not going to psychoanalyze these uh, these men. But of course, it's called sexual harassment, so there's got to be something sexual going on there. But it really is about the idea of power and taking advantage of people, and that's really where the problem is. And that is why, for example, uh, that unlike other kinds of discrimination, an individual is personally liable for engaging in acts of unlawful harassment. You know, the one of the interesting things to me, one of the aspects to this that's that's so intriguing is the phenomenal number of people who will actually cover up for somebody's behavior like this. I mean, actively, not just turn around and go, I don't see this, but who will help them do it. Why? Well, LaDonna, that gets to the very point that we were just making about power, because power uh, has its effect, not just on those who are directly subjected to uh, sexual harassment or unlawful harassment based on a protected class, but also to those who might be able to stop it, but who have a similar kind of fear as those who are subjected uh, to this sexual harassment. And that's the problem. There has to be a basic culture shift within an organization for this kind of thing to stop. And it's not clear exactly how that going to happen other than a decline in power in the person who is engaging in the alleged harassment talk about sexual harassment as a crime what what is it as a crime well, of course, I'm a civil lawyer, so uh, as far as sexual assault goes, it involves some sort of a touching or attempted touching that uh, to the uh, sexual organs. As a civil matter, uh, unlawful sexual harassment is engaging in conduct of a sexual nature or directed at someone because of their sex. Uh, it be, it, the conduct is unwelcome, and the conduct was sufficiently severe or pervasive to alter a person's environment, their working environment, and it created an abusive working environment from the perspective of both the individual and a person with the same fundamental characteristics, basically the same gender. That's basically the definition of hostile environment sexual harassment. Quid pro quo sexual harassment is what you have here. It's a classic casting couch. Do you, uh, give, uh, give me sex and I'll give you a job or I'll make you a star. That's really the, the model of uh, quid pro quo sexual harassment, which is why it's interesting we're seeing it now with Mr. Weinstein. Thank you so much for your time, Dan. That is San Diego State University business ethics lecturer and attorney Dan Eaton with